Our speaker this evening, Peter J. Roberts, large-scale ecosystem engineering with algae. Well, Peter, uh, Peter comes to us uh, with a long background in environmental uh, biochemistry. In fact, that was your PhD work, uh, and you've been working with that for quite a while. But, uh, but you really wanted to be an engineer. Well, I, I shouldn't be an engineer. I'm always twice to attract another engineer. <laughs> but we're glad that uh, you're looking at the uh, ways to put the uh, put uh, science to work, and of course that's what engineers do to make that uh, uh, scientific work uh, some practical for, for uh, people to use. And uh, we're anxious to, I'm anxious to learn what's what you've learned here in the uh, recent work. Uh, your recent work as technical director for the Alphabet Bioenergy Program at NMSU. We welcome you and thank you for coming. Thank you for the invitation and thank you all for coming. It's a great pleasure for me to be here and every scientist loves to get up and talk about what they spend all their days and nights thinking about. Uh, so I've, I've got about 30 slides for you. Uh, I'm going to kind of go through them at a semi-leisurely pace. Uh, if you have questions that are just really urgent and you have to ask them, go ahead and raise your hand. I'll be happy to uh, try to deal with them while that slide is up, otherwise we can take questions at the end. A lot of people that have contributed this work are, are in the room. Uh, and I'll try to go through some of them on the slides and then maybe some, uh, introduce some of the other folks uh, at the end of the talk. <clears throat> As Wayne said, my early interests were in environmental biochemistry and way back when I was in, starting in graduate school in 1977 and 78, uh, my thought was that biochemistry was eventually going to play a role at very large scale. <coughs> Uh, in terms of uh, rebalancing systems that have become out of balance since uh, industrialization happened on the planet. I didn't think I was going to have to wait, you know, 30 years uh, to really uh, have a chance of making an impact. Uh, but, you know, we've been reasonably productive along the way. We've learned quite a bit. Uh, and right now, the last five years of my career, I've spent uh, trying to work out methods for scaling up algal biotechnology. Uh, currently, the largest uh, successful companies that depend on algal biotechnology are, are producing on less than 1,000 acres. And to get to these large-scale impacts that, that look on paper to be very promising, we need to increase that by one, probably two orders of magnitude, and that's not going to be easy. So the bulk of my talk is going to be talking about cultivation barriers. But I'm going to try to put that into both an engineering and an economic context for you first. Uh, and, and that'll explain some of the decisions that we made along the way. So in a nutshell, this first slide sort of uh, describes uh, our overall thinking. That the energy, water, environment nexus, which is what the EPSCOR NSF uh, project is all about, uh, is one that is both critical and, and imminent in terms of need for large-scale new technology. And this word disruptive is an important one to define before we go too much further. A disruptive technology is one that's a little bit difficult to imagine currently. Uh, current versions of any disruptive technology are, are a little bit half-baked. Uh, and yet, when the issues and, and uh, barriers are overcome, they can transform an industry and put uh, industries that have been uh, in leadership roles for decades out of business. And an example would be the cell phone. Uh, in the early 90s, you know, people could imagine a cell phone, uh, but it was essentially limited by transmission towers and the lack of miniaturization and software development and so on. But people kept working away on it, and it's transformed our world. Um, but if you go back even a little bit further, I was 12 years old in 1965, and my best friend's dad was working the highway department, hauling uh, flasher signs around. And he had, essentially, a walkie-talkie that allowed us, we were, he took us over to see a San Francisco Giants baseball game, 
coming over Donner Pass, and he was able to call his wife, <coughs> catching it through on a phone. So that technology actually goes back a lot further than we might imagine. So that means that, you know, by analogy, we should be able to predict what's going to be happening 40, 50 years in the future. And that's what I want to talk to you guys about today. What I think is going to be going on in terms of new technology at the energy, water, environment nexus. Uh, to put this into a business context, um, the algal industry at a large scale does not really exist yet. And that's because the economics don't favor it. And it's really a stretch to get there. And so when I looked around at opportunities where the investment and financing might be easier, I landed on wastewater treatment as one of those ecosystem services that represents an opportunity to get this new technology off the ground. And that's because current wastewater treatment is an energy intensive process. Even with uh, anaerobic digestion and cogen recovery, we're still um, needing to pay, uh, we can only get about 50% of our energy costs out of that kind of a cogen process. And yet the energy in the wastewater itself, the chemical energy in wastewater, is four times what you need. So we're, we're throwing an opportunity away. And so the idea is, our goal is to identify a, a stream of unit operations that allow us to do energy positive wastewater treatment. And if we can do that, we can take the energy savings for the operation of a wastewater treatment plant over 5 or 10 or 20 years, and use that as collateral to get financing to go back and do the retrofit on the wastewater treatment plant. So, that's the opportunity. The challenge is how do you figure out each one of those unit operations? What are they? How do you optimize them all together, not separately, but together so that you get a process that makes sense? So the first part of my talk, I just want to introduce the team and the resources. Uh, some of the people are, are here. Uh, <clears throat> Tanner Schaub is not. He's an analytical chemist extraordinaire who does our oil analysis. I won't be talking about his work today. It's a little bit technical, but I encourage you to invite him for a future uh, science campaign. He does some incredible stuff with uh, his uh, mass spectrometer. Uh, Xu Guang Dang is working with us every day, and some of his graduate students are here in the back uh, uh, on extraction and conversion of algal biomass into uh, bio-crude oil. Uh, Dr. Nimal Condon is here. Uh, I'm going to stand up so people can see you. And Wayne Ben Voorhees uh, is also here. <laughs> there we go. Uh, civil engineering, bioreactor development, and energy analysis work is what uh, uh, goes on in Dr. Condon's lab, as he is known. Um, we've also um, worked with Shauna Ivey in animal science. Uh, there's another opportunity to use L LG for single cell protein for supplementing animal feed. Uh, feeds into next month's um, uh, topic of, you know, can we feed ourselves uh, with what we can grow in New Mexico. Megan Starbuck provides us with uh, analysis and, and advice and, and economics. And Omar Hogeen is a new professor in plant and environmental sciences who does a lot of metabolic modeling of course. The, uh, this is the, um, uh, what do you call it, the banner for um, uh, the New Mexico EPSCOR project. The six projects are shown in the circles uh, on the top. Uh, and the fundamental idea here is that the nexus of energy and water is defined in that first line. We need water for energy. For example, cooling towers from power plants, they use an awful lot of water. We use tremendous amounts of water for hydraulic fracturing, for um, uh, recovery of, of gas and, and oil from depleted fields. And of course, we also need energy for water, uh, and primarily for pumping and desalination. Tremendous amounts of low quality water being produced through hydraulic fracturing right now is just being re-injected into wells down in the ground, two miles deep, never to see the light of day again. And that's fresh water from ranchers and cities that are being sold to oil companies uh, for that process. Uh, we are really mortgaging our water future uh, for short-term gains in, in petroleum. That's a non-sustainable uh, issue. And if we can come up with uh, new sources of renewable power, we can drive desal uh, uh, plants to, uh, to recover some of the value of that water that would otherwise be lost another opportunity for us. 
And of course, everybody knows about um, global warming and the CO2 as a greenhouse gas. Uh, we are intent on trying to develop CO2 utilization pathways. Uh, CO2 is a, is a nutrient, obviously, for algae. Uh, enhancing the CO2 con content <coughs> increases growth rate dramatically. So we need to identify waste sources of CO2 that we can use as an input to make renewable energy. That's a system that makes an awful lot of sense. Um, and of course, nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizer um, can be recycled from the hydrothermal liquefaction process, and I'll talk a little bit about that as we move on. <clears throat> so in addition to the NSF resources that are coming through EPSCOR, we're also the recipient of a new um, a uh, grant from the Department of Energy called Realization of Algae Potential. Uh, NMSU is a lead institution on that, and I'm the principal investigator, and I'm lucky enough to have collaborators from Argonne, Los Alamos, and Pacific Northwest National Laboratories, Washington State University, Michigan State, a company called Algenol Biofuels out of uh, Fort Myers, Florida, uh, Pan Pacific Technologies out of Australia, and a refining technology company out of the Midwest called UOP Honeywell. Our, our approach here is to de-risk algae cultivation, and that is the, it's the, that is the long pole in the tent, so to speak, in the overall uh, process. Uh, and it's a complex one. So part four of the talk will be on, on algae cultivation. Um, we also have some uh, funded work to look at low energy harvesting processes, and we're going to attempt to increase the yield of our bio crude oil through genetic engineering approaches, uh, <clears throat> as well as increasing the growth rate. I won't be talking about that work. It's being done by uh, Dick Sayer at Los Alamos, and is also part of the New Mexico Consortium. Uh, and then the hydrothermal liquefaction is the other technology that we can use to optimize the recovery of bio crude oil from algae uh, and get the yields to the point where the economics start to make sense. So the second part of the talk is basically to give you a status of where we are with edible biotechnology and why we're interested in doing it in the first place. So this is a slide that came out in a publication by uh, a fellow, a New Zealander by the name of Chisti in 2007. It's, it's been shown a zillion times in conferences around uh, the world ever since. And it just um, points out what sort of yield we can get in terms of liters uh, per hectare from different crops. And we can see here from, from corn oil, we're around 172. Two different yields of algae uh, were way, way, way above that. Um, the best one that's actually in business right now is an oil palm plant. Of course, that can only grow in the tropics. Uh, and oil palm uh, uh, productivity is, is pretty good. Uh, downsides on that are that you have to clear rainforest to grow it. And the carbon footprint associated with clearing the rainforest is as estimated to take maybe 75 or 80 years. Quick question. Are you presuming on that slide that all of the available forms of transportation are converted into something you can burn and oil as opposed to gasoline? Or is it based on present division between mostly gas engines and some oil? Burning? So this is only the yield of vegetable oil. All right, we're not, there's no downstream processing. No, but you say 50% of transportation fuel needs. Most, most vehicles, as far as I know, can't burn oil. That's correct. So are you presuming that everything would be converted to an oil burning uh, the engine? Vegetable oil is very easy to convert into a variety of different fuels with technology that exists today. Okay. The feedstock is the real issue. So for example, uh, Global Alternative Energy is a, is a small company out of El Paso linked to Mesilla Valley Transport. They have a biodiesel facility. They use vegetable oil and cooking grease, and they produce about 14 million gallons of, of fuel, <coughs> biodiesel fuel a year out of that. 80% of their costs are feedstock. 20% is their plant and the operation. So it really is the feedstock for these operations that are driving the economics. So if we translate those, those numbers into a map, uh, uh, the land required to displace 15% of the U.S. transportation fuel usage. And this is uh, um, a slide that we borrowed from Sapphire. I'm going to Bryn Davis in the back of the room from Sapphire. Uh, if you want to talk to uh, Bryn about the Sapphire operation, you can grab him after the, the seminar. Um, the bottom line is that forest waste takes this much space. This is projected on the map of the U.S., obviously. 
corn store, we're talking about 50 million acres, corn ethanol, 90 million, tree farming, 70 million, switchgrass is a tall, rapid growing uh, C4 plant, 90 million acres, and here's what you need for algae. <laughs> Nevertheless, it looks small on that map, it is gigantic, and the amount of water involved is gigantic, and it is not a simple matter whatsoever. Um, the New Mexico advantage is that algae growth is obviously driven by uh, solar radiation. And in actual fact, we have too much uh, light flux here that it's difficult for the algae to use it all. As a matter of fact, they evolved to take up more than they need and be wasteful as a competitive strategy to prevent competitors from moving in on them. And so one of the opportunities for genetic engineering is to re uh, equilibrate their light harvesting system so they only take up as much as they need to grow. That's the good news. You can do that. It's been demonstrated and, and the benefits have been uh, measured and documented. The bad news is it's an anti-competitive strategy. If you do that, the genetically modified algae are going to be less competitive in an open environment and they're probably going to be taken over rapidly by wildlife strains. So you got to figure out a way to protect your new strain from uh, wild type competitors are going to come in and remove that advantage. The big New Mexico disadvantage is water. And evaporative water losses um, from in New Mexico are around eight to nine feet per year. And so that means that you're going to be, uh, your water is going to become more and more salty. Your makeup water, if you're using a brackish or underground uh, water source that's high in total dissolved solids, your salt is going to creep up and up and up, and pretty soon you're going to be growing only strains that can grow in the Great Salt Lake or other hypersaline bodies of water. Or you're going to have to come up with a new source of fresh water. In New Mexico, that's a non-starter. Everything is spoken for already, and there's no, there's really no new water. <laughs> so water conservation was my first and primary design principle when I got back into this game uh, about six years ago. How do we figure out a way to grow algae in New Mexico without any evaporative water loss? And this next slide kind of demonstrates why it's important. It's from a paper by a friend of mine by the name of Jason Quinn who works at Utah State University now. He did an analysis of the water usage and, and evaporative makeup water here in, uh, in this color. And it's, he just looked at four different types of, of fuel products that you could make from uh, algal starting material. And the bottom line is no matter how you slice it, no matter how you process it in your downstream, uh, the water usage is dominated by your evaporative makeup water. And again, this is a non-starter for New Mexico. It's good news for the southeast and Gulf Coast region where they have plenty of water. Bad news if you're interested in economic development here in the Southwest. Uh, so I think I've covered a lot of this. Let me just jump in here and, and reiterate that what we're um, interested in are alternative water sources that aren't being utilized productively right now. They include both municipal and agricultural wastewater, and I'm thinking primarily about feedlots, uh, uh, dairy waste, and so on, um, and where there's both nutrients and water that's otherwise evaporating and being lost. We also have produced water from oil and gas extraction. For, um, uh, for, for oil wells, the amount of water that comes up with the oil goes up as the age of the field increases. For gas extraction, it's just the opposite. Nevertheless, there's an awful lot of oil that has to be disposed of, and right now, producers pay to have it disposed of in wells. Um, there are brackish and uh, uh, saline sources, uh, but they do need to be cleaned up. Uh, and there's a small company in New Mexico called El Dorado Biopia that has a process for doing that uh, with algae. So those are some of the opportunities that we're looking at. And that's kind of the state of where we are with uh, our large-scale algal biotechnology. So in part three, I want to give you just a short introduction to the notion of industrial ecology. And I'm not going to go into too much detail on this slide. The basic notion is that the Industrial Revolution was driven by being able to take a source material, do some manufacturing and clean up on it, and make a product that had value, and then throw the waste downstream and down 
the road and let somebody else worry about it. And while there were not so many humans, that process worked okay. And as the population grows and the waste products become more troublesome and we end up with environmental issues, basically industrialization takes us away from the chemical steady states that, that the earth uh, established in the pre-industrial era. And as population grows, we have to begin to actively manage those. And on an industrial scale, we're talking about finding uses for every waste stream from any industrial process and turning those waste streams into an input for another industry, such that the sum total of all of those transactions ends up being a net zero. Right? And that's where humanity is going to have to go if population predictions for the 21st century hold true. There is no choice about this, ladies and gentlemen. We have to do this. And there are fortunes to be made in doing it. Um, fortunes to be lost as well if you make the wrong bet. So let's be clear about that. There's lots of folks that have already had great ideas that turned out not to work. Um, so we need good science, we need good engineers, and we need those folks and disciplines talking to one another to sort this out. So let's kind of take a look and step back a little bit. How many of you are watching the new Cosmo series on TV? It's pretty good, isn't it? I mean, I'm sorry, my talk isn't that good. But I don't have their question. <laughs> uh, so I went to the internet and I found just a couple of pictures that I thought would be useful in, in describing this sort of pre-industrial ecological balance. And in this kind of a scenario, you have a, a land environment adjacent to a body of water, and there will be waste coming from the, the land from runoff and the activities of plants and microorganisms that degrade the plant material and animals and so on, and that will run off into the water. And it will carry with it nitrogen and phosphorus. That's what the N and P stands for. And what happens in the presence of water, N and P and sunlight and CO2 is that you get algae to grow. <laughs> and those algae can in turn set up a, 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 an aqueous-based ecosystem in which the algae are eaten by invertebrate rotifers and ciliates, and those are eaten by little fish, and the little fish are eaten by bigger fish, and yada yada. And the whole thing is in more or less in balance, and you never end up with a situation where there's too much algae for the ecosystem to keep it in balance. When population goes up, you end up having higher, much higher productivities from the use of artificially uh, um, derived nitrogen and phosphorus. We use petroleum and a process called the Haber process to make ammonia in huge quantities, and that was responsible for the green revolution of the 20th century. Unfortunately, we put too much of that nitrogen onto our fields, and it runs off into our aqueous system here. Now we have way more nitrogen and phosphorus. We end up with more algae than we can utilize. The algae, instead of just being eaten by the invertebrate organisms and them being eaten, eaten by the fish, the algae settle down into the water column and they start to be degraded by bacteria. And the bacteria are consuming oxygen in the process of doing that. And then the whole system becomes anoxic. There isn't enough dissolved oxygen in the water column to support the life of the fish. You get dead the fish, the whole ecosystem collapses. That's our dead zones. I'm sorry? That's our dead zones in the ocean. Is a dead zone, just like this at the end of every major river in the world, as a result of this uh, overuse of rivers as a pipeline for pollution. So <clears throat> this is also an opportunity. We can intercept these uh, streams of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus rich uh, material, uh, use sunlight and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, uh, and do this in a controlled fashion, and then work that biomass into usable energy products, we now are um, making lemonade from lemons. And that's the whole idea. But how do you do it at industrial scales? That's the key. And so just to put one slide of chemistry in for you, this is the chemical equation for photosynthesis in which we have water and carbon dioxide and the nutrients that we've been um, uh, talking about, plus sunlight, uh, producing products over here in the form of CO2, that's just a chemist's notation for carbohydrate. Uh, lots of other things are made from that carbohydrate. 
and oxygen. And this is shown as one carbon because it's a balanced chemical equation. We have one carbon on the left and one carbon on the right. If you look at and count up all the oxygens and hydrogens, they're balanced too. This equation goes to the left as well. That's how animals make their living. We, everything that we take in and eat and respire uh, into CO2 and water uh, ultimately comes from photosynthesis. And in pre, the pre-industrial earth, these arrows, the flux through those in, in both directions was roughly equal. And what's happened over the industrial era is that we're using more and more of the, uh, the photosynthesis reaction <coughs> is being uh, overwhelmed by the respiration reaction. And it turns out it's not us respiring that's, that's causing the CO2 accumulation. It's that this reaction going from right to left is the same as it is for combustion. Respiration and combustion are essentially the same reaction. Just the respiration is done in a controlled fashion inside cells, and combustion is done in an engine. So combustion of petroleum is overloading this equilibrium going back to the left. We have to balance that out. That's biochemistry at a very large scale solving an environmental problem. So the solution, um, or a solution, if we're going to tackle wastewater treatment first because we think we can finance the plant retrofit based on energy savings, we have a series <coughs> of unit operations in which we start with an area in which we're going to grow out the biomass. We need a harvesting system. We can fractionate that harvest if we want to. Um, part of what we could do is pull out the nutrients at this stage and put them back into production of more biomass. There's technology that um, the guys in the back of the room here are working on today to, to realize that return. And then from there, we can go to this process we call hydrothermal liquefaction. I'll explain in the next couple of slides. It's basically like a pressure cooker heat up a liquid solution under uh, with containment so that the pressure builds at the, at the same time. If you've ever cooked with a pressure cooker, you know it rapidly, it rapidly uh, cooks stuff much faster than it would otherwise because of the combination of the heat and the pressure. So if we tune our system right, we're going to get a CO2 rich gas. That CO2 can go back to our biomass production system to increase the growth rate. We're going to get a solid residue. That solid residue or biochar has several different uses that we could utilize. Uh, one of which is simply to burn it to produce the heat for the hydrothermal liquefaction. It's also good as a soil amendment. There's a variety of different things you can do with this solid residue and a biofuel. <coughs> so those are the fundamental unit operations that we're trying to figure out how to make this work at scale. Right? <coughs> so let me just take a sidebar here and say, um, if you drive to the airport in El Paso and you don't take the Anthony Gap, but you go down through town, um, after you pass downtown, if you look off to your right, there's a refinery down there. It's called, it's called Western Refining. And if we were to supply Western Refining with all of their feedstock needs, based on current uh, cultivation uh, yields, it would take somewhere between 25 to 30,000 acres of ponds. Uh, to do that. And right now the cost uh, per acre of pond uh, is a little bit difficult to nail down. You hear estimates as low as $40,000 an acre and as high as $150,000 an acre or more. So we're talking about 100, you know, that's a lot of money. You multiply 30,000 times either one of those numbers, it's a big number. Uh, so we need to be able to drive down the cost of production. We need to be able to drive up yields so that we don't need to spend that much money. It's a big problem. So uh, harmonizing all these different unit operations so they work well in concert is not a simple task. Now if we take a look at uh, the current risk assessment for each of these unit operations, this is where we have the greatest risk. And the risk is based on the ecosystem of the open ponds or, or PDRs at large scale are sensitive to invasion by those little invertebrate grazers that I was talking about earlier. They love algae. They'll find it if it's there. And they can kill a crop overnight. Uh, there's 
viruses that can attack the algae. There are uh, pathogenic fungi that will come in and wipe out a crop. Uh, there's a lot of issues around choosing the right organism that can survive at very, very large scale. Crop protection for algae is a fundamental agronomic need, like it, just like it is for weed or corn or tomatoes or anything else. And that crop protection science is in its infancy. Uh, a lot of the work has been done at, at Sapphire. Uh, unfortunately, it, the company keeps that technology under wraps, and so they know a lot more than the rest of us do. Um, and hopefully they're going to make a, uh, a, a smashing success out of applying the crop protection knowledge to open ponds and show that that can work. And that would be a huge boon to everybody in this field. But it has yet to be demonstrated. Uh, and so the financial analysts, the engineers, and the scientists all agree this is the biggest problem. Harvesting is not a problem, but it's a risk because the energy of harvesting is so hot. Algae don't get very dense in water, and so you're going to have to remove 99% of the weight of your harvest is water. You've got to remove it all before you can do anything with it. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's a high risk. The rest of the stuff, there's technology to deal with it. It's just a matter of whether or not you can glue together your supply chain and the expense associated with doing it. So I mentioned um, several times now that we view wastewater treatment as a bridge. Um, the design criteria for uh, an energy positive system I've listed here, we need a, it, it, essentially this is how we've approached it. We decided right off the bat we're only going to try to do something for arid climates where sunshine is high and you have to deal with the evaporative water well system. So everything is tailored for desert uh, or warm environments. So this would work in the southwestern U.S. Uh, it might work okay in the southeastern U.S., probably any subtropical or tropical area of the world. Let me remind you that there are two billion people in the world that have no access to wastewater treatment whatsoever with huge public health consequences. Uh, and so this is a part of the world that needs this technology. We're not talking about upgrading or replacing, we're talking about new technology. And so, I, even though I didn't write it here, one of the design criteria in the back of my head is that you would want this to work at a village scale, a city scale, and a big city scale. All right? And if you think about arid places, oftentimes there's a lot of land available not too far away that isn't very expensive. So those are good aspects of focusing your design criteria uh, on other regions. So we're going to use a closed plastic bag system that will prevent evaporation and odors and, and will experience passive solar heating. So then we're going to need an algae that likes it hot. So where do you go? You go to a hot springs where algae evolved to deal with warm temperatures. Uh, and so I'll be telling you about a, a, a wonderful organism called Galdiaria sulfuraria uh, that fits that bill. There are at least three different energy products that we think we can need. Uh, um, tailored to a specific site. Um, you can either get bio crude oil, uh, biogas for distribution, and you can turn that biogas into electricity. The technology for doing all of that is available. <coughs> what you need to focus in on is the beach stuff, the harvesting, and so on. We need efficient CO2 utilization inside our closed system, and we need a CO2 supply. And so co-siting of this kind of a system with a CO2 source becomes a very important criteria. It's not necessarily something that we're designing for, but it's something that will drive where these plants will arise. And of course, the nitrogen and the phosphorus are the key nutrients for algae growth, and we need a source of those. It needs to be inexpensive enough uh, to, to match your needs. <coughs> Um, so our current technology, uh, and I won't go through this in too much detail, but the basic idea is you have a, a, a solid liquid separation, the liquids go into a tank and you bubble that tank with air or pure oxygen and microorganisms start to grow on the carbon in there. There's a fundamental imbalance of carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus in wastewater. There isn't enough carbon in that wastewater to support the utilization of all of the nitrogen and the phosphorus. So when the carbon is depleted, the microorganisms stop growing, 
and there's still too much nitrogen and phosphorus in there. So we take, we put that out into the environment, uh, and you end up with eutrophication and dead zones and so on. So we end up having to go to a nitrification and denitrification, which we take that valuable nitrogen resource and convert it into N2, which is 80% of what we're breathing in and out right now is nitrogen gas. It's inert, doesn't react well, it has no value. So we take a valuable commodity to prevent eutrophication, we turn it into something that's useless. That's how we do wastewater treatment these days. Now you can do some energy recovery through anaerobic digestion, but you only get about 50% of what you need. In our proposed technology, photosynthesis in CO2 provides the balance between carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. So you get in one step removal of all of the carbon, all of the nitrogen, and all of the phosphorus. Um, this word mixotropic simply means that you want an algae that can both do respiration and photosynthesis. Remember respiration was going from right to left on my chemical equation slide and photosynthesis was going from left to right. There are plenty of algae out there that will take that thing in both directions. So then they will remove the biological oxygen <coughs> instead of your activated sludge microorganisms. Right? Um, and then you're going to end up with a lot more biomass over here than you do over there. If you're trying to treat it as we treat sludge now, that's bad. But if you have a good process like hydrothermal liquefaction for turning that into one of those three different fuel products, that's good because it means you can get to an energy positive plant. Um, and then the hydrothermal liquefaction allows us to uh, uh, recycle our nitrogen and phosphorus, sell it for agricultural production, or make more algae. If we're interested in ramping up the amount of biofuel that we produce. So maximizing biomass uh, is the key to making the uh, energy positive wastewater treatment work. So here's a diagram about what uh, hydrothermal liquefaction uh, looks like. Uh, it's, you basically have a, a biomass source and a slurry pump, and most of this is involved in heat exchange. This is your liquefaction reactor, and what you, you pressurize and heat. Um, and the, the products uh, end up going to a separator. Uh, this whole bit here is about energy recovery and water recovery, and this is kind of what the bio crew looks like. This is from a group uh, run by uh, a fellow by the name of Savage at the University of Michigan who's done a lot of uh, pioneering work on, on hydrothermal liquefaction. You can see it's pretty viscous stuff. Um, nevertheless, technology exists today to turn this into jet fuel, green diesel, gasoline, whatever kind of fuel you want. This Dealing with this stuff is not the right limiting step. Okay, last part of the talk. Um, how do we get around the barriers to large-scale uh, algae cultivation? And I've chosen uh, two uh, pictures on here. Um, they are pictures of systems that were horrible failures. <laughs> um, on the left there is uh, a company out of Arizona that was that was, that was working with the Arizona Public Utilities and and they had a fair amount of money and a pretty illustrious group of founders and it failed utterly uh, in terms of its promise. Uh, it's a picture of their bioreactors and uh, they lost uh, their shirts and went out of business in 2008 or 9 I think. Um, this one on the right is much closer to home. This is a company out of uh, and it's right across the river in Texas, uh, along the, the name of the town, and that, the first one, um, not Anthony, but immediately west of Anthony. The company is named uh, Valsant, uh, and that was a parent company, and Vertigro was the, was the local outfit. Uh, and the idea here was that he had these hanging bags, he used to put them in a greenhouse, uh, and the idea was a great one, in that you want the you want to distribute the light in a way that is maximally tuned to the algae's needs. And increasing the surface area, it's a little bit of a no-brainer to think, well, you can go up and dilute the light. And so conceptually, it was a beautiful idea. In practice, they couldn't find an algae that didn't form a biofilm on these surfaces that they couldn't clean up. And so this idea also failed. 
It's being tried again by uh, a company called Algenol out of Fort Myers that I'm collaborating with. And I'm hoping that they solve that biofilm problem. Uh, and I question them about it, and uh, they don't tell me. Um, but they seem to be betting the bank on it. Uh, and so we'll see. Um, the new technology does come along. We know a lot more about bioformation than we used to, but it is not a simple process. And I am and remain skeptical. So this is what we have at New Mexico State. Uh, there's three different types of bioreactors. One is, is from a company called Solex Biofuels. I was associated with Solex for a little bit more than a year as their vice president for biotechnology. <coughs> Uh, their main product were, was a system for uh, growing algae in a water basin that allows for temperature control, optimum light distribution, uh, and CO2 distribution, and algae grow like bunnies in this thing. They love it. They grow about 10 times faster than they would in an open pond. That's the good news. The bad news is this thing is ridiculously expensive. <laughs> and the panels are highly engineered to make them work well but they have to be replaced probably at least twice a year. And the labor and cost associated with building and switching them out didn't make sense at scale. Solix is still in business, and what they decided to do is, is grow these algae for high value products, uh, products that you can sell for thousands of dollars a kilogram. And then you don't need a huge footprint. You can afford to spend a lot of money on your system and make a go of it economically. And they're competing directly with a company called Solazon. Their approach to getting around the scale-up problem was to do it in fermenters. Forget about photosynthesis, just feed them sugars and gigantic industrial fermenters and get them to make the high-value products that you want. And so it gets a bit of a game between um, Sapphire and Solazon to see if you can survive. Um, this is, these are the first-generation alginol bioreactors on the lower right here. This is the, their Fort Myers facility. These, uh, each one of these things is about 50 feet long. They have about 18 centimeters of, of depth in the bottom. They have a drive that mix, provides mixing. It's just kind of a, a water foil that goes back and forth and creates eddies uh, that um, provide good mixing. Uh, and we're in the process of setting up uh, a whole field of these things that are test fed at Fabian Garcia um, Ag Science Center. Um, these are the ones that they abandoned. I like them because algae never get on this surface. There's no fouling that happens here. The major risk is that they're over engineered and they may end up having a biofilm in the bottom that could end up attracting critters that are going to essentially make continuous operation difficult. We have no data on how long these things will last. For the amount of money going into them, it's probably they're going to need to last a year to three years in order to make the, the economics work. So I think the jury is out on this one for large-scale use. Uh, it might work, it might not. Definitely not here. The one up here on the top is actually Bryn Davis's design from Sapphire. And it's the simplest of the lot. Uh, it has Basically, it utilizes plastic tubing that you can buy for moving air around in very large greenhouses. It's already treated for UV resistance. They use sandbags to create a berm around the outside, an essential berm down the middle, and you stick a paddle wheel inside that bag to chase the water around in a circle. They enrich the air inside this bag and this bag with CO2, and we're going to basically have a bake-off between this design and this design out of David and Garcia. My money's on this one because it's simple and it's cheap. These things have some cool features too, but we'll find out. And <clears throat> I can't tell you the answer yet. So what sort of temperatures do you reach in those systems? This is data from Algenol collected in Sonora, Mexico, which would be a little warmer than what we have here. Um, and it shows the, the seasonal variation. This is... Um, August of 2009, this is winter 2010, summer 2010, winter 2011. And you can see these are the diurnal variations, and the diurnal variations have the sun to on nature. So the red lines define the temperature range in which the hot springs algae that I'm going to tell you about next like to grow. 
and between the green bars are the temperature range where an organism called chlorella that we're also working with likes to grow. Both of those organisms can be grown in fermenters at very high density. So the notion is that you could do a seasonal crop rotation between chlorella and Galdieria and keep your production going year round. And we'll be testing that out with our DOE plant. So <coughs> Galdieria sulfuri is a red unicellular eukaryotic algae. It grows between pH 0 and 4. To give you a marker, uh, Coca-Cola <coughs> is about pH 2 and a half. Lemonade is about the same. It's pretty acidic. Things don't like to grow with that pH. If you leave your Coke out on the on the tabletop for a week and look at it, there's still not a whole lot in there, right? Not, I mean, it's not like a glass of milk or something. Um, that's good for us. Um, they grow up to 56 degrees centigrade. They're both photoautotrophic and mixotropic. That means they can take that chemical reaction in both directions. Um, they grow on a very large number of carbon sources. I'll tell you a little bit about that. Uh, in the next slide, in this rubisco discrimination, it just means that there's an enzyme inside of all plants and algae that fix CO2 into carbohydrate. And these red algae uh, are really good at that. Is there less to attack the, because it likes the acidic? Is there less um, a virus or fungi or whatever that would attack it? Yeah. So if you didn't hear that in the back, she's making the observation that at acidic pHs, because there's so, so many less organisms that can grow, the, the whole ecology of that system is, is really simple. Um, and so there's fewer viruses, or at least we presume that there are fewer viruses, uh, fungi, uh, and grazers that will cause problems. So far, that's, that's proven to be so. Um, but we, we need bigger scale operations run over long periods of time before we're going to discover what the problems might arise. I'm not naive enough to think that there aren't issues that have arisen, and I think we need to know and understand more about the ecology of those Yellowstone hot springs than we know right now to be able to predict what, what might go wrong and, and head it off before it happens. Uh, but that's another grant and an, another agency. <laughs> okay, so this is just the temperature and pH limits of life. And so if you look at those two different dimensions, if you're way down here on the pH scale, and you're relatively high on the temperature scale, you've eliminated most of everything. That's the whole idea here. And that's what this slide is just uh, uh, to tell you. Um, most of the algae that's grown in the world today is this spirulina, and it can grow up to pH 11, 11 4, um, and that's part of the reason why it survives. It also has this curly Q morphology that makes it difficult for the grazers to consume it. It's just little green balls that you just sweep them in. But if it's a corkscrew, it's a little bit different. So there's a couple of different reasons why these guys might be the most robust uh, of the algae that are grown currently for commercial reasons. So here's a slide on the different um, carbohydrates and amino acids and stuff that Galdieri can use for growth in the dark. Uh, here's a reference to the genome project. Uh, so we know the full genome of Galdieri, uh, and we know from the analysis of that genome uh, that it, it has transporters for all of these different things from different um, monosaccharides, uh, both uh, hexoses and pentoses, uh, sugar alcohols, <coughs> excuse me, um, glycerol, disaccharides, acetate, amino acids, polysaccharides. Uh, it is quite versatile in terms of what it can utilize. It's a little bit of a mystery as to why it's so good at it. If you, if you look at the number of carbon transporters in that genome, it's about the same as what you see in wood rot fungi. Uh, or other filamentous fungi that have enormous heterotrophic uh, catabolic capabilities. And why this called the area is, is essentially equivalent to them uh, isn't quite understood yet. Is that growing um, a chocolate cake there? I'm sorry? Is that growing a chocolate cake there? <laughs> well, it just meant <laughs> Never mind. chocolate cake is a uh, source of sugars. Put the chocolate cake in some water, add the call the area, put it in the dark, it will grow. Oh, <laughs> right, these are electron micrographs of Galdieria taken by a colleague of mine, uh, uh, Ursula Goodenough at Washington University in uh, Washington University in St. Louis. 
This is what they look like when they're growing rapidly in a photosynthetic mode. And when they become depleted of nitrogen, they de-differentiate that chloroplast. It shrinks uh, mightily. And you see all these granules in the, in the cytoplasm, that starch that's just polymerized glucose. And you see these lipid bodies formed as well. These are the <coughs> sources of oil for um, conversion to biofuel. Uh, the great thing about hydrothermal liquefaction <coughs> is that it could produce high yields of biocrude oil from either this material or this material. And that's important because it takes time for these things to convert into these things. And if you don't have to wait for that, then your land can be more productive. Your yields per unit time are going to go up. Uh, but nevertheless, we know that the uh, genetics and biochemistry for synthesizing uh, vegetable oil, which is essentially what these lipid bodies are, exists in this organism and it can be exploited by genetic means. All right, coming into the home stretch here. This is data from last year at the Fabian Garcia um, Science Center with Goldie area growing in the sapphire style photobioreactors. Uh, starting on May 18th and going through June 6th. Uh, and they go through a typical lag phase where they're adapting to their new conditions. The red line represents the daily temperature variation. And then they hit a region of growth where it is more or less linear uh, with time. And they achieved about two and a half grams uh, per liter uh, in that period of time. If we kept adding nutrients and let it go, this would continue to go out. We haven't yet identified what the upper limit uh, in the sapphire bag system might be. Uh, but two to three grams per liter is our target, so we were happy that we achieved it. This is the first, um, uh, this is the first experiment that we did, uh, actually. And our yields were about 16 and a half grams per meter squared per day. Uh, our target for our DOE grain is about 20, so we're close even with the wild type. So we were really delighted with these results. Uh, this is a result from uh, Dinesh Selvaramnam, who's in the audience in the back of the room here. This is his first paper on measurement of the rate of removal of nitrogen and phosphate uh, from uh, a, um, a wastewater system and showing that. In, in systems that are very similar to one that I just showed from the last data, we get removal of both phosphate and ammoniacal nitrogen within several days, uh, achieving discharge limits. And so this is our proof of principle data on the nitrogen and phosphate removal uh, rates uh, for Goldie area. We're working now on the biological oxygen demand. That's the removal of the carbon sources. Uh, and that work is ongoing, and I'll not to invite you back to see that. Um, okay, last data slide. Um, we'll work with uh, Professor Adrian Onk in Plant Environmental Science uh, to look at survival of bacteria that might be deleterious that are in our wastewater treatment system now. And so what they did is they isolated an E. coli strain, 13B6, that was resistant to, highly resistant to multiple antibiotics. Um, and there's good uh, data in the literature that, that resistance to multi multiple antibiotics uh, correlates with, with survival. Uh, and basically what we did is we looked at two different temperatures, 40 and 48 degrees, and uh, four different pH values. Uh, and the bottom line is that at, at pH, at the lower pH, particularly one and two, um, survival at either temperature was measured in, in minutes. Um, if we go to a little bit higher pH but higher te temperature, then they can last for a day. Uh, the bottom line is that the conditions under which we're growing called the area are not conducive to growth of human bacterial pathogens. And in point of fact, we did an eight day selection under those called the area growth conditions with primary untreated uh, sewage water it would have had all kinds of viruses and bacteria in it. Uh, at the end of eight days, we plated that material on very rich bacterial auger. We had a single survivor. It was a bacillus lichenoformis strain. There were no other bacteria that were uh, viable at the end of that selection. And one of Dr. Condon's students is studying the uh, physiology and biochemistry of that uh, bacillus strain in case we should need it 
to speed up the removal of biological oxygen demand. We don't think that's going to be necessary, but that could be an important resource. So um, to summarize, uh, the last part of the talk called the area grows well, uh, with little risk of culture failure. We haven't observed any so far. Most microorganisms die under the same conditions, so that's good. We think this is going to be a stable, uh, robust system, and it's inexpensive. We're going to get more biomass since we're going to get more energy from the photosynthetic wastewater treatment process, and we hope that this will translate to underserved global communities. Uh, in tropical and semi-tropical areas. So, uh, last slide just uh, acknowledges uh, again my collaborators and funding sources. Thank you for your attention and patience. I'm happy to take questions.